Well, hello again everybody. Well, today we're going to be looking at RF field strength. Well, if you were to speak to some of my friends, they will actually confirm that I actually got quite drunk on Friday night. And of course, that leads to problems, least of all being forced to sleep on the settee. Worse still, it can actually lead to fairly unsafe or unsavoury eBay internet purchases. But I'm sure you'll all be glad to know that I did the right thing. Now, of course, when we do go surfing on the internet, looking to comfort by some nondescript piece of test gear, which probably won't work anyway, there's really two very important factors that you must consider. Now, the first of those is quite how drunk you happen to be. Now I confirm that after, after drinking one and a half bottles of red wine I was really quite drunk. And the second factor is how much does the uh, piece of test gear or gizmo actually cost? Well I'm happy to say that this actually cost me about £19 and uh, I did actually purchase it via Amazon. Disclaimer, I did buy this with my own money, it wasn't given to me, um, which I guess just makes me even more stupid. Okay, first impressions, just going to give it a squeeze test. Well, as of most Tech Life products that I've uh, purchased in the past, it does feel relatively solid and uh, it does appear to be made out of that plastic. I don't know how to describe it really, but it's kind of almost a satin velvet finish. It is slightly rubberized, slightly soft. Well, it also feels a little bit tight, like that type of plastic that if you leave it in a drawer for five years, it turns into goo. Hopefully it won't, but uh, yeah, who can tell? So on switching it on, I've noticed we've got a green light at the top. Uh, we've also got some kind of scale at the bottom and it's actually indicating 24 degrees. So it looks like there must be uh, some form of thermometer built into this thing as well, which uh, may be useful if the rest of the equipment isn't useful. Oh, we've got a scale at the bottom and this is in uh, MG, which I'm guessing is something like, is that milligauss? So this is actually set at the moment to detect magnetic fields. So maybe we can, uh, maybe we can see if it is sensitive to magnetic fields. So let's see if we can do that. So the first little test I'm gonna do is I've got one of these little rare earth magnets and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move it up to the side of the uh, detection head which I'm guessing is built into here so just doing that I notice that the scale is still on zero so magnetic fields are generally measured in uh, do they call it, I don't know do they call it gauss or gauze I think I've always called called it Gauss, a Gauss field. It's measured in units of Gauss, and at the moment the, the unit is actually displaying zero, zero, zero. So I'm guessing that means it isn't actually sensitive to static magnetic fields. Now I have actually seen these Gauss meters that will actually measure static fields, but this one appears not to. So just to prove that, I'm just going to move the magnet around. Oh, and I've noticed that we've got an amber light, and if I waggle the magnet around really quickly, it goes red. So that last little test was using a rare earth magnet. I'm wondering how many of you remember these things. Not a piece of equipment that's seen very often today. So this is a demagnetizing tool and these were used very commonly for uh, demagnetizing tape heads. For whatever reason, tape heads become magnetized. I'm guessing they become magnetized by the earth's magnetic field and when they become magnetized, they are less effective. Of course, many of you won't even own tape recorders or some of you have probably never even really seen them. So what this is, is basically just a big coil of wire around a piece of iron and we plug it into the mains here and it's an electromagnet so on the first positive half of the main cycle maybe the uh, the magnet will become magnetized in one direction north and south and then when the AC field reverses the north and south poles will swap round so what you do is you get your tape head and you would switch this uh, demagnetizing probe on you touch it to the tape head and then you'd very and then you'd kind of wipe it over it like that and as you wiped it over it you would actually start to back it away back it away further and further from the tape head and it would actually leave your tape head demagnetized uh, all i'm going to use this for is basically it's just a fairly powerful electromagnet so this device should be very sensitive to that in, on this magnetic setting so i'm just going to plug it in and switch on up oh, and of course it does it picks it up right away so as I move our electromagnet closer, you can see we get an amber light and we keep going closer as the magnetic field strength increases, it goes faster and faster the tone. 
and then we get a red light and it beeps quite frantically. But it doesn't have to be a coil of wire to produce a strong electromagnetic field. Actually any wire that's got current flowing through it will cause that. So you can see I've just got one of my old compasses here. It's lying on a piece of wire and this piece of wire is just connected to my power supply. So if I just turn the power supply on we shouldn't see this needle twitch. It's going to respond to the magnetic field. So that's a wire. You can see the effect that we get there just by running one amp of current through a wire. Now of course these magnetic fields occur totally naturally because you can see that what direction the needle of our compass is pointing in. If I actually just move the, uh, turn the compass round, you can see that the, uh, the needle remains pointing in the same direction. So we're all being exposed to these really quite strong magnetic fields just from the earth itself because of course the earth is a big iron ball and uh, it is a magnetised iron ball. Well you can see I've got on my bench here, I've got an IEC cable. Now the other end of the cable is actually plugged into the main supply so this has got 230 volts on it. Now if we just put our meter up against the cable again I wouldn't actually expect to get a reading at the moment so we're still on the uh, on magnetic detection setting on the MG Gauss range and at the moment we're getting zero 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 it's not detecting that because we proved earlier in order to actually have a magnetic field around uh, a cable we actually need to be drawing some current through it if there's no current flowing there is no magnetic field so this proves that but I would actually expect this if we actually put it onto the electrical field setting now which is volts per meter so we're now on volts per meter I would now actually be able to expect this thing to pick up the electrical field because although there is no magnetic field being given off there is an electrical one So that certainly does seem to work. Yes, it is picking up our electrical field. So I've got another piece of equipment here, which is a Fluke Volt Alert stick. So this is one of those non-contact voltage detectors that you can use for, uh, well, I'm going to say, what would you use this for? I mean, I certainly bought one for very roughly checking cables, checking that circuits were in fact energised, but I really particularly dislike this flute one. It's very, very insensitive to the point, I think, of being unsafe. Now, of course, you would never use something like this for the purpose of checking a circuit is de-energised, but you would want to maybe use it to check that a circuit is re-energised. And it's just really hard to get a reading on it. It's just so insensitive. So we'll switch it on. And as soon as you switch it on, it does actually flash at the end. So it flashes as proof just to say that the thing's powered up and it's actually working. This isn't an indication that it's actually detecting volts. So if we actually just put this onto our cable, and you remember this cable is live, we get absolutely nothing. You know, it isn't detecting it. But if you really kind of play with it, he said. Eventually you can actually get it to detect something. So just looking at the display on the unit, it is quite a nice display. I can see it's also got a thermometer built in because it's saying it's now 26 degrees in my workshop and it, it probably is, although I think it might be detecting the heat off my hands here. So when you switch on the backlight it's got a little LED torch on it which, uh, well that doesn't appear to be particularly bright but yeah maybe that'd be useful for something and also on the back here we've got a screw thread so I'm guessing that we could also uh, mount this on a tripod if that's what you want to do because as we did see it does seem to uh, depend how you actually orient the uh, I'm guessing this is a sensor head so it does matter how we orient this is it going to work again there we go so if you actually put this on a tripod you could actually set it to the orientation for whatever you want to do with it so looking at the instructions that came with our EMF meter, it says that it should actually be sensitive to frequencies up to about 3500 megahertz, which is pretty high. But I have been doing a little bit of testing with, uh, well this is a handheld radio and uh, it's set to 145600 and it's on, well it's, it's actually quite a powerful radio. This is set to produce about 4.5 watts at the moment, so if I just key that up, well 
it's not actually displaying anything at the moment is it more sensitive in that orientation yeah it doesn't really seem to be so although it does claim to be uh, sensitive to RF uh, energy it doesn't seem to be certainly not on the electrical field I think it might do something on the uh, on the magnetic field so let's try that well again still a very very low reading so it doesn't seem to be particularly responsive this unit to uh, high frequency RF fields now it does appear that a lot of people put these field strength meters to all kinds of unusual applications and one of the most popular ones is for uh, ghost hunting. Now when it comes to ghost hunting I don't actually think that this TacLife EMF tester is actually the perfect tool to use. Um, it has several problems. I mean we saw that it has a very very limited frequency range. I'm not sure how long the battery life would be. This torch isn't very good either. Um, but the main reason that it's probably not very good for ghost hunting and for detecting spirits is uh, it's because they don't actually exist. But of course for the feeble minded out there this could actually be the perfect tool. Now another group of people who may find an instrument like this particularly useful is those that are afflicted by electrosensitivity. So apparently some people who are exposed to these electromagnetic waves, they suffer from all kinds of uh, health problems, rashes, feeling unwell, depression. I mean there's a whole list of uh, symptoms and uh, I think the primary symptoms really seem to consist of living in California, having just that little bit too much money. But of course one of the worst symptoms that these people suffer from is gullibility. Well I've got to admit the thing that I'm most interested in is looking at the electrical fields that are given off by radio transmitting antennas and as I've just demonstrated this uh, tack life device doesn't seem you know particularly uh, sensitive to that. Okay, we've got a small reading there. Oh, it's gone back to zero. Let's just try the uh, VM again. Yep, so it doesn't seem particularly sensitive. So I think we could actually build something which is going to work a lot better than that. So let's have a go. Now, when it comes to RF field strength meters, there's actually quite a lot of different types that we could choose from. Now some of those field strength meters will be designed to be sensitive to a particular frequency and they'll tend to have some form of tuning element at the front which is usually just an inductor and a variable capacitor. Now back in the day things like frequency counters and oscilloscopes they weren't particularly available and if they were available they were very expensive and they were outside the cost of the average radio amateur. So it was actually very common for radio amateurs to build these tuned RF field strength meters. So that would tell them that they were transmitting some power, but more importantly, they could actually stand a chance of knowing what frequency they were transmitting on. And I am told that back in the day, it was part of the licensing conditions that you would own one of these tunable type field strength meters, so you would know where you were transmitting. Now, of course, we're all spoilt today with modern frequency counters and oscilloscopes. Now you can see on the bench here I've got my Bofang radio here and uh, you can see it's actually very easy just to connect this to this absorption watt meter. So if I just key the transmitter you see we get a direct readout so this thing is transmitting about 5 watts. But the reason that I want a field strength meter is because there's quite a lot of radios out there and especially some of the very cheap CB radios that I just fancy playing with. They don't have a 50 ohm output like this. All they actually have is, a, well just as an example, this isn't this is just a handheld receiver but you'll, you'll know what I mean. There's a lot of radios out there that just have a telescopic whip and the, the telescopic whip antenna it's actually just fixed and uh, it won't actually present a 50 ohm impedance anywhere so it's not not like you can just put a crocodile clip onto the antenna connection and feed that into your absorption watt meter because that, that won't actually work. So what I actually want to do is I want to use this for tuning up the transmitter of just very very cheap type walkie talkies, CB walkie talkies and it's only a bit of fun really. So for what I want it for I don't need one of these tuned type RF field strength meters. In fact really I want something that's pretty wide band because that means that it'll work on a variety of radios. Now I also don't need a field strength meter that's super sensitive because after all I am looking at trying to transmit a, a reasonable amount of power from these handheld radios when I do the final alignment. Really I would have thought that anything between about, oh let me just make some figures up, maybe anything between quarter of a watt and 5 watts would be fine for me. So that's the kind of range, so that's not particularly low power. 
So for my requirements I only actually need to build something that's really very simple. So I went and had a look on the old interweb for inspiration and uh, as you can see there's no shortage of published circuits. There's actually hundreds to choose from. From the very simple ones like this that just use a couple of diodes, a capacitor and a resistor to things that are much more complicated. So for example this one uses the analogue devices and this uses a log amp so it actually produces an output in decibels which is quite a nice scaling feature. Now for no particular reason this is actually the circuit that did take my fancy so you can see that it's got a couple of MOSFETs there and it's also wired in a Wainbridge configuration so really it should be quite sensitive. But unfortunately I wasn't able to find any information on this apart from the circuit diagram but of course it is quite a simple circuit. So the next thing I did was to have a route through the junk box to look for a sensitive ammeter, maybe something with a 100 microamps range. Now unfortunately I couldn't find anything that was anywhere near suitable, so I had to go online again to look for one to buy. But of course, being such a tight Yorkshireman, yeah, I didn't really want to do that. But then another thought struck me. So just going back a step to the circuit that I was going to build, I could see that it had two MOSFETs on it. And that actually just reminded me of a micron to meter that I'd been playing with recently. I'm afraid that the print-off I've got here really is quite low resolution, unfortunately. But you can see what we've got here is we've got a, a Wayne Bridge arrangement. It may not look like a Wayne Bridge because we've actually got two MOSFETs here. Normally in place of these MOSFETs, it'd actually be another two resistors, but they've replaced those resistors with MOSFETs instead. And of course, the advantage of using MOSFETs is that compared with things like bipolar transistors they've got a very very high input impedance. Now MOSFETs aren't always good at radio frequencies because they tend to have quite high gate capacitance but this is actually being used in a DC circuit because the actual incoming RF waveform is actually being demodulated and smoothed DC here. So we have our two resistors here, we've got our meter movement and we've got our two MOSFET transistors and then we've also got a potentiometer down here which is actually used to uh, balance our bridge and set it, set this needle to the zero point. So I've just pulled out my very old micron to meter. Now this isn't a traditional analog meter, it's a little bit special in that it's actually got a FET front end. And uh, there's a little drawing here, and uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but it basically says, it says dual FAT. And uh, these transistor arrangement, it's very reminiscent of this circuit here. And uh, I actually just remembered that and I thought, well, we've actually already got a meter movement here. It's already got the zero adjust. Here it is. This is the, uh, the pot down here that does the zero adjustment. So I thought rather than using one of these uh, rather sad and crappy old meters, I could actually just reuse this micrometer because uh, I don't use it very often. Now of course I'm sure that what I could have done is I could have drilled a hole in the top of the meter and uh, stuck a little telescopic antenna out the top of it but I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep the meter as intact as possible. So I think what we're going to do is effectively we can uh, we're going to replace all this part of the circuit here. We're going to replace that by using our micrometer. Now you wouldn't have to use a micrometer. You could actually use any probably modern digital meter because any digital meter that you use is going to be relatively high impedance just like this one. It's probably got some form of FET at its front end. So if you've got a digital fluke meter or some other make of digital meter that'll probably work fine. So somewhat naively I was hoping that there might actually be a circuit diagram in our manual here that comes with our micrometer but no sadly not so of course as we all know manuals are just uh, useless they never contain anything useful. Now because this circuit is incredibly simple I decided that it really wasn't worth putting it in a large separate box so I actually decided to try to make it as miniaturised as possible. Now because I wanted everything to be a nice fit onto the front of the micron to meter what I decided to do was take a picture of the meter and I imported this into Fusion 360 as a back canvas. You can then scale that canvas very accurately and you can kind of use it as a reference when you're sketching. So the first part to draw up was one of the banana plugs and I actually base this on a cut down version of a banana plug I just found lying around in the junk bin. And you can see that I've dropped down the banana plug on the canvas roughly where it's going to go. Now at this point I did actually take some additional and accurate measurements so that we could get the spacing between the banana plugs absolutely correct. 
And the final part, and actually the easiest part, was actually just to model the box itself that we're actually going to fit all these different parts into. And you can see that I've just done a quick cross section there, which is a nice feature of Fusion 360. So when I'd finished modelling up the box, I actually exported this as a 3D model. And then I imported the model into my slicer software. And I use Simplify 3D. So the job of the slicer software is to turn our 3D model into a set of very simple kind of mechanical instructions, which my 3D printer will understand. And before 3D printing the enclosure, it's always a good idea just to simulate it to look for any problems. And once that was done, I printed out our enclosure on my 3D printer. Well, as you can probably see, I've just been in the garage and I've taken our four millimeter banana plug and I've just cut the back end off it because normally these are designed to be stackable so that you can install another banana plug and join one connector lead to the other. But I don't need that and uh, having that extra material on the back of here just means that everything is a little bit bigger and uh, I was just conscious of wanting to keep the size down. But what I need to do before we actually install this in the little housing that I've made, we need to uh, put some wires on it. Now I did think about doing something more exciting like drilling and tapping it inside here but in the end I just well to be quite honest I couldn't be bothered and I thought it was more work than was necessary so all I'm going to do is I'm just going to solder some leads coming out of here and then we can solder them to the components. I think we will put a little drop of flux inside it and I think the next thing that I need is just a simple leading wire so I think I'm just going to try to bunch this up a little bit so hopefully some part of it should uh, should form a good contact inside here. Is that going to be a good fit? Well, actually, that's a little bit loose. Let's uh, make that a bit bigger. Okay, we've got that in there. It's just making contact with the side walls. Let's go ahead and re-grab this. Well, I'm afraid no fancy tools this time either. It's just going to be a gas lighter. Let's put a bit of heat on here. OK, well I'll be the first to admit it isn't very elegant, but it is easy and it's practical. So I'm just going to give our terminals here a little bit of a clean with some acetone because I want to remove some of the flux out of them. But I'm actually also going to glue these into the housing and uh, these will glue in better. If uh, they're actually clean I remove all my jammy fingers off them. Oop. That was uh, about 500 times more quantity than I actually wanted. That just uh, splurged out everywhere. Oh dear. Now I've got to admit, when I was looking at making this, I did actually find in RS Components, you can actually buy some uh, 4mm terminals like this, banana plugs, which are designed just to be bolted onto an enclosure. They actually have a screw thread at one end, but they were like £10 a packet, and uh, to be quite honest, being a tight Yorkshireman, I, uh, I definitely wasn't going to spend £10 on them to buy a pack of five. So I didn't bother with that, so hence I've decided to cut down these uh, banana plugs. So I did go ahead and I did actually roughen them up a little bit, the uh, the outside of these plugs. So they've actually been rubbed over with some abrasive sandpaper because I want to give this a uh, two-part epoxy, something to grab hold of. I have actually found that these 3D prints, um, they do actually take glue very well. I think it's probably because the surface is so rough from the way it lays down the layers. So I think that this will um, this will glue really strongly. I don't think we'll have a problem with it. So all I need to do now is um, effectively just push my terminals into here, or that's the idea anyway, and hopefully it will stay there. Now I did actually design these to be quite a tight fit. I hope I didn't make them too tight. Okay, there we go. Okay, there's one of them in. Don't think that one's coming out. Let's see if we can do the other one before the glue sets. I don't think it'll take long to set this because it's actually uh, quite warm today in my workshop room. Yep, that is actually starting to go off now, so I haven't got any time to mess around. Oh, 
Well, that one went in much easier. Maybe it had a bit of a burr on it or something like that. Okay, so I'm just going to leave that set and I've about halfway plugged it into the meter because I just want to make sure that it does set with the uh, banana plugs as well lined up as it can be with this meter. I think it's going to be fine. Well, of course, I really should have checked these terminals for continuity when I actually soldered the wires on, but we might as well do it now. Works. So I did leave this overnight for the glue to set solid and uh, yeah, it certainly has done. Let's just check it does fit. So that seems to fit in there nicely. So of course when we're actually constructing an electric circuit the uh, component values are very very important and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the component values that happen to be lying around in this box here because uh, that is more important than getting up out of my chair and finding something more suitable. But you will actually be glad to know that uh, pretty much anything will, uh, will work in this thing. The capacitors can really be anything from about 22 picofarads to 100 nanofarads. I think they, they're probably 100 nanofarads decoupling capacitors left over from something. We could just as well use a ceramic disc. Uh, so we use a 1 meg resistor which actually goes across the terminals of the meter. You do need a load resistor when you're actually using one of these little diode detector circuits. So this is our load. Um, what you can actually do is you can choose the value of this 1 meg resistor to kind of suit what sensitivity you want. I kind of want quite a high sensitivity so I'm going to use a 1 meg ohm resistor. If you wanted less sensitivity because you were going to be using it for testing higher powered transmitters what you could do is you could actually put a, a lower value load resistor across the terminals of the meter. So I'm using 1 meg but pretty much anything between 50k and 1 meg ohm will work fine. So here's 1 meg because that's what's in the box. Here's a whip aerial that I did have to actually buy for this project. I think these are about two or three pounds on Amazon. And uh, it's a type that's got a little joint on it so you can pivot it, pivot it round and you can also turn it into position. So I actually thought that I wanted to be able to, uh, to be able to move the antenna around and set it in a position. Now the other thing about the antenna is I've chosen to use a telescopic antenna because you can actually use this as an attenuator. So again, if the signal power is too, too low, what you can do is you can extend the antenna, the whip antenna a bit more and uh, you'll get a higher meter reading. And if the signal is too high, all you've got to do is uh, collapse the antenna. So this this is just a very simple way of uh, attenuating the RF. Now the most important part of this project is actually the two diodes and uh, I'm just looking for something suitable and uh, not finding anything in my junk box here. What we actually need to use is, ideally would use a germanium diode uh, and again I've written some notes here. So a germanium diode, uh, you want something like a, an OA91 or a 1N34. I haven't actually got either of those diodes in stock. Um, the OA91 was, um, well that's a, a diode which is beloved of schoolboys including myself because uh, that used to form the base of uh, a crystal uh, detector radio. We used to build crystal sets, that's what we used to use, a crystal earpiece and one of these OA91 detector diodes. But uh, you can't easily buy these anymore from places like RS and Farnell, the kind of old technology. Um, the nearest that you might be able to buy is a 1N34, but unfortunately they don't seem to stock them either. So I ended up buying the nearest thing that I could kind of find, which is actually a Schottky diode, which is a, a BAT41, a BAT41 diode. But if you can find something like a, a proper old-fashioned germanium diode, you will find that this circuit will work an order of magnitude better. It will be much more sensitive even than using the, uh, the signal Schottky diodes that I'm going to use. So I'm just going to start with soldering our capacitor here onto this little uh, solder tab and hopefully my whip antenna is going to slot into there. It should be quite a tight fit. Okay that seems okay. I'm going to take our two diodes and I think I'm going to try to uh, shall we try to solder them together. One of the diodes needs to go to the negative terminal of the uh, voltmeter and the other one needs to go to the positive. So they are kind of facing away from each other these two diodes. Okay, 
Yeah. Okay, that wasn't very dexterous of me, that was a bit messy. I'm sure most of you are screaming at me because there's probably much better layouts than I'm doing here, but um, as I say, it's extremely non-critical. As long as we can get all these components in, it really doesn't matter. Well, okay, I think that could have been a bit neater, but I'm sure it'll still work fine. So let's just screw the lid on it and give it a test. Seems to be missing a screw, so just had to go and find one. Okay, a long screw is always better, isn't it? So on the bench here we've got two handheld radios and they're both set to around 145 600 so they're on the two meter band. Now one of the radios is set to 5 watts, the full power output, and the other one is, uh, is set to 1 watt and I'm not sure which is which so let's just key this radio up first. Okay the needle went over and full scaled on the 1 volt range so let's try the other one. Oh, that went over and full scaled again. So this is the beauty of actually using a, a voltmeter and our voltmeter has got a range selector switch. So we're on the one volt range there. So let's go to the three volt range. Just try that again. All right, so this, this radio has now gone about halfway up. And the other radio is pretty much full scaling. So this is the five watt radio and this is the one watt radio. So what we should be able to do though is, uh, although this is full scale, and let's go back to the 1 volt range, yep, it's gone hard over, but I should be able to just use the antenna as uh, an attenuator. Okay, so now, now it isn't going full scale. If we want more sensitivity, we can just pull the antenna up a bit. So I think that actually works quite well. Now, I'm not sure what frequency range this will work over. As I say, we're on 145, 600 at the moment. We can also go to 400, approximately 450 megahertz. So let's just give that a try as well. Does it work on that? Yeah, works fine. So certainly we know that our little RF field strength meter, it certainly works fine up to uh, 450 megahertz. I wonder if we can test it at the lower end of the frequency. So I did actually design our little RF field strength probe here to actually work with uh, handheld CB radios. But as it happens, I don't actually own a handheld CB radio. So I'm afraid I'm going to be using it with a full powered CB on 5 watts. And uh, I'm actually using kind of a, an external CB antenna because it's all I've got. So I don't want to uh, key this up very long because the... Uh, the standing wave ratio is going to be terrible and it's certainly not helped because the antenna is just uh, it's just being leaned up against a metal cabinet so yes that isn't that's far from ideal but let's give it a go I'm sure that the needle is going to just scoot all the way across so let's try that oh and of course it does it goes over very hard let's re reduce the uh, signal strength a bit okay that's a bit better now so just looking at it the needle does seem to crawl across just a little bit so I suspect that it is being somewhat over damped I've probably got too big a capacitor here I've got a, one of the big smoothing capacitors that goes across the meter movement that's 100 nanofarads it would have probably been better to maybe had a, a 10 nanofarad uh, it's just the meter movement is just a little bit sluggish it's a little bit over damped so maybe I was building this again I would maybe just put a I don't know, a 10 nanofarad in that position. I don't actually mind it being slightly over damped because it's much kinder to the meter movement. As you can see, it isn't wanging over and trying to wrap itself around the end stop. So that's not such a bad thing, but some people might want it to be a little bit more responsive. So if you want it more responsive, just reduce the size of those capacitors. I think the reality is you'd probably have to experiment somewhat with the capacitor values depending on the actual meter that you're putting it onto. This micron to meter is it is a FET meter, so it's got a very high input impedance. Depending on what other type of meter you use, you might find that you'd have to tweak some of the values. 
Now of course I did actually design this little RF adapter to work with this micrometer but there's no reason why you shouldn't use it with any other high input impedance meter. So here's my uh, flute meter. The only problem we might have is um, whether or not the antenna kind of fits in a useful orientation. Okay that's not bad is it? That seems to work so let's put this, let's try the millivolt range and uh, well let's just have another go. Okay, so that's gone over scale at that. Let's see if we can reduce the uh, the input level. Oh, and it's still going over scale, so we're going to have to drop this onto the voltage range. Okay, so it's coming up there. It's reading about 5 volts. As we get closer, the voltage increases. So the field strength is increasing as we get closer to the antenna. If we move further away it comes down. That works quite well because it has actually got the uh, the analogue little bar graph display on there. Now I have just noticed that we are actually getting a minus symbol there. So obviously the uh, the diodes are the wrong way around for the way I've got this plugged into the meter. We could actually turn this round and it would read positive rather than negative. But um, it probably wouldn't fit on the meter as well. Yeah, the... Uh, kind of aerial comes out the wrong side. I mean it'll still work. But now now the meter's going positive rather than negative. But of course the actual numbers that which are, are being put up on the meter they're actually fairly meaningless. There's no calibration. It does give you an indication of field strength. Clearly we can see as the radio comes closer that the, uh, the field strength is increasing as the number goes up. But those numbers don't directly mean anything. I think it works better though on an analog meter. Just for interest, let's try plugging this into an AVO meter. I expect it to work very, very poorly on an AVO because the input impedance of uh, just an old fashioned meter like that is so low. But let's give it a try for giggles. So certainly it does work with the AVO but it's uh, nowhere near as sensitive. So I'm, I'm actually using the 5 watt radio at the moment and uh, we can't very easily make it full scale. Here's a quarter watt radio again. Now one of the main uses for an RF field strength meter like this is for actually an analysing antenna systems. So as you would expect, as I actually move the radio closer to the field strength meter, the needle does rise. But it doesn't rise consistently. You'll find a point as we move closer and closer, it actually starts to fall off again. There we go, you see it's actually gone lower. And so what's happening there? We're actually getting point standing waves occurring. So the actual short wavelength is quite significant at 450 megahertz. If we're actually to repeat this test at 1 megahertz, actually moving the radio backwards and forwards, wouldn't actually make a lot of difference. But this relatively high frequency, 450 megahertz, because the wavelength is relatively short, you would actually find that if you measured this, that's probably something like half a wavelength or something like that. So what we're actually seeing is we're seeing standing waves. So just to try to demonstrate that, I'm quite a long way from the field strength meter, so I'm going to get closer. As I start to get closer, you can see the needle rises and now it's falling. We've hit one of those nulls again. So I'm going to keep going closer. Now the needle's rising again. And now it's falling again. So we've hit another null point. Just for interest, I'm just going to change the radio back to 2 metres. I'm going to increase the wavelength. And we shouldn't see quite the same effect. So I'm just going to do that. So as we approach the field strength meter again with our radio set to 2 meters, we do have a dip, but we certainly don't have the same number of dips. We've got about half the number of dips, and I'm guessing that's because the wavelength is about twice as long on 2 meters as it is on 70 centimeters. So I'm pretty much right under the wires at the moment and uh, yes it is actually going a little bit crazy. We've got a solid red light. Is that the maximum? 741. That's for the uh, electric field. Let's see what the magnetic one is. So we're not picking up anything on the magnetic field so maybe that's to be expected. Let's 
let's see what the maximum is we go up to. Okay, so it does look like the maximum reading does coincide with about the centre of the pylon. And actually the point we are in the road, we've actually got two pylons which meet each other. So we'll just be able to effectively walk under this one in a second. Well, I think I'm just going to stop here and put my tinfoil hat on just in case. So this one is actually a physically bigger pylon and uh, I'm guessing that it maybe operates at a higher voltage. I'm not exactly sure but the reading is considerably higher than the last one. And again we do seem to get the peak reading when we stood pretty much immediately under the conductor wires. So I'm just going ahead and I've taken out the micron to field strength meter that we built and I've got to admit I wasn't actually expecting this to pick up anything because the uh, the components in it probably wouldn't be make it particularly sensitive to the uh, the RF fields but it is actually picking up much more than I thought. Now it's still very small compared with those 5 watt transmitters we were using. I guess if I move away from our pylon a little bit more that needle should drop down again. Okay, I probably just walked about 10 metres and the needle's now dropped to uh, actually just above zero.